Repair University Live November. We are so excited to have you here with us, and we hope that you had a wonderful and amazing Thanksgiving last week. Quick shout out to Larry. As you can see, the set today is, is just me and Mark. Larry, I got a cup. you brought his I cup. Got a, I got a big cup in memory of Larry. The cup in honor of Larry. <laughs> Larry is at, was with Audi this week, um, going through Audi training and welding mm -hmm. certifications and all that. So we do miss you, Larry. We're going to try to carry on in your honor with the information that we share today. Um, and I'm sure if I mess up, he's going to text me. Oh, so yeah. Oh, I may yeah. have to check my phone mid broadcast. Check your mid show. Yeah, and make sure that we're doing good. <laughs> Well, Mark, we got a lot to cover, yep. so we only Let's have an hour right to do to it. it. So glass, um, what? Why are we talking about glass, Mark? Is, is glass important? Well, you know, I, I took the iCar glass class, I think, in 1995, and in that moment, I owned a shop, and I was like, wow, glass is an issue. You know, the windshield being a structural part of the car, and then, you know, now that the cafe standards, they're turning around, changing the metals in the cars. And when they change the metals in the cars, they're trying to get strength. They, they're putting all kinds of glass in for strength and protection and that, and even roofs and you know panels of the car are non glass. Yeah, yeah. So and in the stationary glass. stationary glass on the side of a vehicle. So you know one of the most important things that I always talk to shops about, and even the insurance company, is is glass is structural. It's as important as a frame rail. Yeah. Um, and we train on that, yep. but we sublet our glass out to someone that yep. we don't really know whether they're doing it right or not. Yeah, you want to consider any urethane set glass on any automobile is structural just like a frame rail. It's got and a crash worthiness to the car. Yep. Um, you know, so even if it wasn't engineered that way, we don't know. <laughs> so we got to treat it that way. Yep. You know, and it's funny when we were doing setting up for this show and the people were, were jumping in and they were saying, oh, well, I'm a body tech, glass isn't my issue, and I'm a painter and glass isn't my issue. Uh, hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna dispel that today. Yeah, glass is everybody's issue from Absolutely. the estimator to the body tech to the painter to even the detailer and the prepper at the end of the Absolutely. repair. So let's get into it. There are uh, a few reasons why a body shop is involved in the glass business. Now we know that there's always our mobile glass repair, windshield chips or busted glass that gets replaced in somebody's driveway or whatever. But yep. in the collision repair industry, we're removing glass for a couple different reasons. It may be that the glass is actually broken, yeah. right? As part glass, of the, yep. the damage. Um, or that a part it attaches to is damaged. Let's say I'm putting in a quarter panel or a lift gate or yep. whatever, and it's got glass in there. Um, or I'm r and i in it for refinish, to be able to properly refinish the vehicle and maintain a warranty. Yep. Um, but there are several different reasons why we're taking glass out. Um, the only thing that kind of changes is whether I'm reusing that glass yep. or I've bought a replacement piece of glass there. So, um, Mark, why, why glass? What, what's the laws? What's the rules around it? I mean, I guess in occlusion repair, we don't have a lot of laws, <laughs> but in glass we do, right? Yes, we do. There's some federal laws. Well, I mean, it's the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, and I, and I invite everybody to go out and Google these, you know, just put in FV, <coughs> FVMSS. Uh, FMVSS. That's a mouthful. Yeah, I'm going to give that is, to you. It is. <laughs> and just Google these and just and read them. And they're, you know, really lengthy and 20 pages each. But, you know, you'll kind of get the idea. But glass has standards. And the two big ones or the three big ones that you're concerned with when you're doing a windshield is 212, 216, and 208. Okay. So, you know, so when we look at uh, 212, 212 is when a collision takes place, the windshield's got to stay in a certain amount. And that is all about the glue, because these things are bolted, they're glued. So it's all about the strength of the glue and the substrate. Wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, because on behalf of Sean it's Collins, adhesive. who I love, we, we've, we've committed to stop saying glue, right? Yep, adhesive. it's adhesive. Okay. It's adhesive, yep. For you, Sean, yep. only for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then 208 is, uh, it really, 208's all about seat belts and restraints. But then we throw the airbags into it, which is a restraint, which uses the windshield to deflect off. So. Now glass becomes part of the airbag system as well. So there's you a know. lot going on there. And then 216 is the roof crush at the very top of the roof. Right, now the one thing about that that I always like to talk to shops about is that it's not just a matter of glass keeping the roof from collapsing, but that's been calculated into a lot of the vehicle. And I know you're gonna, you're gonna cover that a little bit later. Yep. So you're breaking it down real quick. Here's where these standards apply and the panels that they apply to. Yeah, and then the one I didn't mention earlier is 219 and 219 is glass movement. So the glass can't move, can't come out, and any more than a certain amount and also needs to deflect the airbag properly and then 216 is at the very top of the a pillars being able to support two and a half times the weight of the vehicle on a normal passenger car on the newer cars so that's a lot of weight that's a lot of weight that's a lot of that's a lot of responsibility on a piece of glass yeah. that's a lot of responsibility on something that i'd say most shops sublet out with and they and they have no idea right and we're going to be going through this and hopefully we have lots of owners, lots of painters actually watching the show because this is this is your liability. 
Right, right. We The glass guy comes in, he rolls his truck in the back yep. of the shop, and then he just comes by in my office and drops an invoice and tells me he's done. Yep. But I may not know what the heck he actually did to that car. Well, but it's also, do. it's not just the glass company, it's all the stuff that the body shop does before the glass company touches it too. So there's kind of a concert that works there. Right. And, so, we'll, and so when we I'm talk to glass companies, glass companies go, well, yeah, will you tell every body shop exactly what you just said? And that's what we're doing here. Right, so as a body tech or a painter, I may make it almost hard or impossible for my glass guy to do his job. Exactly. And I'd be pretty mad. You know, painters get pretty mad at body men, right? Yeah. When we send something over that's not ready for paint because yep. I'm preventing their ability to make money. And yep. so I guess we got to think about we're preventing those glass guys from making yep. money. So. No matter whether I'm reusing the glass or whether I bought a replacement piece of glass, I, I got to get it out, right? Yep. It's got to get out of the it's car. It's got to come out. So before I walk to the car and start thinking about removing some glass, what, what should I be doing, Mark? Well, there's the, well, there's a, a three-step process. Number one is go to iCar. And we've been talking about this in many, many shows. We got to research, you know, because there's a lot of times the glass is not reusable. It's a lot of times where you know, is there a certain thing with that particular vehicle? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then when we start to look at the position statements, what's reusable, what's not, you know, like, you know, and I got to just give a shout out to Toyota because Toyota has done a lot with research on glass. And they're very specific in what they say. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Toyota here, but there's other ones. Right. But then we also got to get to the OEM model specific as well. So we need like three different sources to go through. So we need the position statements, and unfortunately, the position statements that you're looking for actually aren't on OEM One Stop, or I couldn't find them in all data. I had actually, in, like for Toyota, I had to go right to TIS. Right. I had to go right to the source yeah. to get it. So an important part to remember here is that as we begin to do our research for the show, obviously one of our initial immediate, you know, obviously I start every day with a repair technical support portal from our car, mm -hmm. and they've done a lot with a new windshield um, and glass um, matrix that yep. they're building that you yep. can just punch and go to so they're extremely helpful for that but I start every day there but but for most of us our general research begins in all data and that's where we started and we had a few issues and, and either we're not finding it in the right place we just place couldn't or, find it yeah we just couldn't find it so we ended up with uh, the OEM position statements going straight to their website yep. for those. now as an estimator I can't just go oh don't worry about it because my glass company's going to come get the glass no. I got to do the research too when I'm writing the estimate absolutely Absolutely, because at the end of the day, you know, say like a Toyota Prius, some of their windows are not reusable. So it, you take it out and you can't reuse it. It's encapsulated, it's part of the structure. Mm -hmm. Now, there's many glasses on, many pieces of glass that are on, are on Toyotas that you can R&I. Okay. But there's some that you just can't. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But you would want to know that the day you write the estimate. Yeah. Not the day the car is going, mm -hmm. because that glass can't go back in. Now, are there other things besides just non-reusable? Are there other yeah. things I'm going to find in this research that's going to affect the repair process or the deliverability of the car? Let's take like the, the 2016 up uh, Nissans. You know, the Juke and the Sentra. If you replace the windshield, you got to replace the rearview mirror. And some of these require some calibrations that I'm not going to be able to do nope. with just a code scanner or a reader. Yep. Whether I have Aztec and I access the OE tools or whatever, I got to have targets. You got to have targets, and if you don't have targets, so that's a trip to the dealer. So now you know you might be dealing with something that's just really small. You're going to R and I the glass, and you're going to put it back in, and now it needs a calibration. So not only do we need to pre and post scan this car now, just for a piece of glass, we also need to schedule possibly going to a dealer or you know some other steps as well. All right, and that's going to affect my cycle time, my touch Absolutely. time, all of those things. And we would want to know right. that in the beginning. Right. Yeah, you, like you already said, what I need to know about this car. I everything. Need to know everything right now is what I yeah. need to know about this <laughs> so car. So what resources are available. Right, so before, yep. as I'm writing the estimate, or before I let the glass company come in and out or touch the car, I'm going to do this research information. Um, is it important that the technicians or the shop foreman or whatever know this if they are subletting glass? Should I be kind of overseeing my glass company? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's rules. And, you know, and every manufacturer that states how to do it, and some do and some don't, but you want to know what that manufacturer wants yeah. uh, as far as their substrate preparation, et cetera, because that's what we're doing in the shop. Yeah. I just for, I, I kind of, it was probably about a couple of months ago, I kind of called a couple of glass locals around the state yeah. and asked them if they had all data. How do you get your OEM information? And they all kind of went, what are you talking about yeah. to me? So, I mean, obviously those guys aren't paying for those subscriptions. Some are. I know there's been a big push lately through SafeLight and they're doing a lot to upgrade mm -hmm. what their technicians mm -hmm. have access to. But a lot of people don't. So the only reason, the only way a lot of these people are going to get this OEM information is if we're pulling it from the yeah. shop side and handing it to them when they walk in the door. Yeah, and that's, you know, what's really, you know, a concern in the industry is all the, just the windshields that are breaking that they're doing out in the field and, 
you know, it's kind of like the guy with a truck. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and the, other, the other part I'm going to talk about later on is you go to YouTube and you watch how to replace glass and you see those videos. Some are okay and some are absolutely wrong. Even though they say they're, you know, XYZ auto glass and hopefully there's not an XYZ out there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you got to really be careful on what you watch. Yeah. I mean, now I do love YouTube and I like people yeah, when they watch too. our videos on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Um, but be careful what you learn out in the cyber world, right? Yep. Everybody's an expert these days. Well, and there's some great videos on Collision Hub. We have some good ones and we're going to show one here yep. pretty soon that's actually from 2012. So kind of forgive the technology. We weren't as great <laughs> with gear as we were then, but we say so. If I'm going to remove glass, let's say I'm one of the shops that actually keeps glass in-house, or even if I want to make sure that my glass companies have the right tools and equipment, yep. what are some of the things it's going to take to remove the glass? Well, there's a, there's a lot of different things. There's, you know, the, the knife you cut with, there's wire. You can basically put a, like a piano wire on and it just right. kind of cuts it right out. And it's, and it's really great. And the one thing we don't want to use, and I'm wait for the phone calls now. Um, uh, here they come. Here they come. I see the I see the board lighting up. I know. Go ahead. I know. <laughs> um, is we don't want to use inductors, and and the reason why, inductors, first of all, most of them aren't used correctly, but even if you use them correctly, the point of an inductor is to break the bond of the paint, so the glass comes out. Now, one of the things we want to do when we R and I glass is we want a bed of urethane in there, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, where it's still we leave some urethane in there. Well, with an inductor, there's no urethane in there. Right. <coughs> That's the first problem. Second problem is high strength steel cars, we're using heat. Now could we potentially uh, mess, up, mess up the, the structure of the car? Possibly. And then on top of that, have we messed up possibly the e-coat below it? There might be foams in there, there might be glues in there. I mean, there's just all kinds of issues with using an inductor. Right. Now that's a great tool. I don't know, yeah, I love, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love the inductors when you use them properly Absolutely. or when you know what you're supposed to use them for and what Absolutely. you're not supposed to use them yeah. for. So glass is definitely one thing where the inductor really isn't a great fit there. Unless I would say, how would you feel about, you know, we have some inductors on the market now that let us set a temperature maximum. Yeah. Um, you know, so if yeah. we knew what our temperature threshold was and we've got a maximum, but some of these you don't, you're just putting heat well, on the Well, you're just car. putting it on until it smokes a little bit and that's what the videos even say. It smokes right. a little bit, now you're ready to go. Right. But what's smoking? Yeah. You know, and then on... And then you also need to do some research on the car. I mean, is there foam fillers in there? Is there adhesives? What can it I mean, take? I mean, you know, most adhesives that break down at 400 degrees. Well, if we're going to be on 400 degrees in pulling the glass in our seams, I mean, we could possibly have an issue. Yeah, there's a lot to do there. So inductors are something that you want to be careful of. Well, Mark, I got the glass out. Yep. And whether I'm replacing um, on a new panel or I'm reinstalling the glass back onto where it was, I'm going to have to use some adhesives. What do I need to know about that for the shop? Well, first of all, most, most windows that are, 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 that are, they use adhesive, not glue. Sorry, Sean. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're working on it, Sean, for you. We're working on it, baby. Uh, it's almost <laughs> always urethane from the OEM. And then aftermarket, we can go urethane, or they do have some two-part products. And the biggest thing we want to make sure of is a couple things. Number one, is it compliant with the OEM strength requirements? And, you know, there's a whole bunch of great products out there, 3M, Sika, there's great products out there that completely comply with it. But you as a shop owner, you wanna make sure that your glass company that you're subletting to is not just using over the shelf urethanes or different things. You wanna get automotive stuff that's designed for it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, the spe specifications of that. Right, and then I need to know as a shop, not only what they're using, but what's that cure time going to be Absolutely. for that product that they're using. Absolutely. And are they doing different products at different intervals in my shop? So yep. if they're installing glass in the morning or whatever, you know, do they use a single part for longer or do they come in the afternoon and think that they're gonna use a catalyzed product? So yeah. there's and, that's, and that's all about what we're gonna talk about later, which is minimum drive away time and then ultimate cure. Right, but now the OEM's gonna tell me what those specs should be on that product. Absolutely. And then all I need to do is make sure that that's, that's what we're doing in the shop, that it meets or exceeds those criteria, exactly. correct? All exactly, right, so and you know, and just a shout out to 3M. 3M is actually very specific on their product, saying here's the amount of time, here's the temperature, here's the humidity, here's how long it is, and it complies with 212. Hmm. You know, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 212. Well, that's amazing. So, now I'm gonna put that adhesive on. What are some things that we need to know about getting that penetration on that adhesive down to the products? Well, the first thing is, and you know, we got to follow the OEM and product maker recommendations. And we can't deviate, you know, if you're going to be using 3M or you're going to be using Sika, you want to follow their product line for exactly how they say to, say to do it, because it's, it's a system, right? Now, one of the things that we see a lot in traveling around the country is they'll pull the glass out of the car. 
And then a lot of times the person that's pulling the glass is not the person that's actually putting the glass back in. So what they'll do is they'll make it nice for the next guy. And what they'll do is they'll pull the glass out and they'll scrape the pinch weld and get it really super thin um, around the whole thing. You do not want your glass company doing that. What do we want them to do, Mark? I want them to cut it as close as they can to the glass and just leave a big mount of urethane in there. So just leave it build up. Now, just now leave if it build I'm going to prep that, I'm going to be heading into paint, what's the best way for me to prep that? Just leave it alone. And then when you go to tape it up, just tape up over the top of your urethane. And then when your glass company comes back in, what they'll do is they'll do the cut down. And we want to leave, you know, like Toyota says, a minimum of a millimeter or more is what Toyota says. So, you know, generally about three millimeters, eighth of an inch, we want to have in there so the urethane can stick to the original urethane. Right, because nothing sticks to urethane better than other urethane. Uh, urethane <laughs> sticks really well to urethane, yeah. And then, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, and you, and you saw in the video where the guy takes the knife and he's doing the cut. Well, how many times have you seen in the shop where the guy takes the first cut, then he takes the second cut, and a third cut? Well, oftentimes, they're gonna put multiple different layers of cuts through the same urethane. So what happens is, is that if we get a really super deep cut on it and we don't you know, pick up the edge, and you'll see your glass company picking up the edge, if they're doing that, they're doing the right thing. If they're not, then what you can have is you can have a cut and you put the urethane on top of a cut. And now we got a leak and it's not even glued to the and car. And a shear issue. Right. Absolutely, and, and a safety free. issue, yep, absolutely. It's gonna free. And then here's the big thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but in the pinch weld where the urethane set glass goes, no Bondo, I'm uh, brand name, but no plastic filler, no filler, period. No seam sealer, no base coat, clear coat, and back to our corrosion protection show, hmm. no self-etching primer. No edge primer. Period. <laughs> period, period, period. No etching primer. Yeah. Now, and you know, unless there's some product out there I don't know of that says use etching primer, but I don't know of any. Now, the other part of it is, and I'm going to talk to the shop owners right now. I invite you to walk into your paint department right now and see how much epoxy you actually have in your shop. What we find is, generally speaking, there is no epoxy in most collision repair shops because that's only for rust in the 60s, right? right. So we got to have epoxy in the shop. Now, don't just ask your painter if you have epoxy because they'll say yes, not understanding the question because a lot of times painters think that their self etch primer is epoxy, mm -hmm. especially the younger painters. So you want to walk in there and then also, when you find out that you, and then if you do have epoxy in there, see how much dust is on it and ask your painter if they know where to use it. Because you might have it, but they're not using it. There are some places you gotta use it. Epoxy under seam sealer from the Corrosion Protection Show mm -hmm. and epoxy under urethane set glass. And then the other thing, when you walk into the, uh, you watch your glass company, they grab the glass primer and they take that cotton dauber with the black thing the glass is out and they kind of all, all the way around. The way around. <laughs> yeah, they just go all the way around. Some products. But it's pretty. It is. It does look good. Yeah. It does look good, except that's not how the product's designed. Most of the products. Now, there are some, but not all. So we would have to read exactly what it says. Yeah, grab that camera, um, read it. You know, and then, and then the other thing we say is when you put, you know, so we say to use epoxy, put epoxy on, put a piece of tape over it. When you pull the tape off, Epoxy's right there, ready for your glass company. Now, glass companies watching this, you probably love me right now, because that makes your job really easy. Now, the, now the part that you're gonna do for your, your uh, glass company is if you leave some of your tape residue on, that's a problem. So you wanna make sure there's no tape residue that they're gonna try and put urethane over the top of. So. We wanna make sure we clean that really well. Absolutely. And it's not necessarily the glass guy that's gonna catch a lot of that stuff. So yeah. if I'm the painter, or I'm the prepper detailer, and that's my job after it rolls out of the paint booth, yeah. I really wanna check that really well. Yeah, and another way to do it, to be totally safe, is just leave it bare metal or you know, whatever, you know, grind the welds down and just leave it. And then paint the car, and when it comes out of the booth, then put the epoxy on. And then you know Th you're good. Then we don't have a tape problem. Yeah, so definitely, uh, I think we, we found a theme in primer between the last show and this one <laughs> that we're just going to keep driving home, yeah. epoxy, epoxy, epoxy. I'm not a, well, I think we even said I'm not a fan of rattle cans. Like, yeah. I know they, no, no know people cans. have, yeah, I just, I just would be happy if they the shake weren't and go. there. You know. And the paint companies are like, we make rattle cans, Chris. I'm like, I know, I know, but I'm just, I would be happy if they just didn't exist yeah. in this world. So this is just, a, just an example. This is 3M single step primer. I just cut and pasted this right off their website. So. One of the things is, it's basically, it's a one part primer that promotes adhesion of a urethane adhesives to glass. Let me say that again. It promotes urethane adhesives to glass. 
This is right off the 3M website. It says right here, apply it to glass. Doesn't <laughs> not say it, pinch <laughs> not all over the place. And then it goes on to say that it works well for minor touch up of pinch weld scratches. Well, when, they, when they're pulling it out, they're gonna get some scratches here and there. And that's what it's for, a minor, a, a minor little touch up. So again, back to the product. So if you see a glass company that comes in and they're taking this thing and going all over, you might want to look at it and go, wait a minute, that's not minor touch up of scratches. That's all over use. And we got a problem. And then will that lead to failures if I'm just using the product? Yeah. That's, well, I mean, now that, now that everything becomes about liability. We have 43 million reasons to, to, to be thinking, right about li <laughs> thinking about liability. And, you know, if you want to bring any manufacturer into it, you got to follow their instructions for what they say. And if you use it in a way that they didn't tell you to use it, you're on your own. Yep, absolutely. And no one wants to be on their own. So, Mark, we visited a lot of shops. We visited some shops together this year. Yep. Um, and shops that had SOPs, that had everything in place, that were OE certified, that should have been fantastic. And, well, what did we find? Well, we found this. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's how most shops do it. So, the first thing that they, they do is they take the metal substrate, metal, aluminum, composite, whatever the frame's made out of. And the first thing they do is they, uh, a lot of times they'll put plastic filler or seam sealer or different things under the different seams. We don't want that in there. And the reason why is because urethane has a lap shear. And lap shear meaning if I glued my hands together and I were to pull them apart, there's like 750 uh, PSI that, you know, they've got to pull it apart. We got to be able to duplicate that in the, in the aftermarket. And the urethanes will do it, but the urethanes only as good as what it's attached to. Right. So you think about plastic filler, you know, for those technicians that like to, you know, do welds and cover their welds with plastic right. filler. It seem to be perfect. Yeah, it yeah. might make it look good. Problem is, is that we don't put windshields in with plastic filler because it doesn't have the strength. So, but if it's underneath our urethane, that's the strength of your windshield. Yeah, I mean, that stuff pops off when you go over the railroad tracks. <laughs> Absolutely. It's definitely going to pop yeah. out in a collision. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and then the next problem that we get is that where they put self-etching primer on. And that happens now in the paint department. So the paint department pulls their stuff that's on their mixing bank off, not using epoxy, and they, just, and they, and they spray self-etching primer. Then they put some sealer on. And then they put base coat, clear coat. And then the glass company comes in and puts you know, <laughs> this whole thing, and then they put the urethane on in glass. Now, the problem is, is that any one of those links of the chain, if they break, the windshield's coming out. Right. In that area. That base coat's gonna break. Yeah, so if the base coat doesn't stick to the clear coat with the lap shear, if the plastic filler doesn't stick, if the acid gets in there, and the reason why acid's such a problem is because acid needs water to cure. Urethane needs water to cure. So those two get together, and all of a sudden they don't stick to each other. So, so that's basically what we don't want to do. Right, and this is what we see everywhere, even well, most shops. I mean, even the the high end, high quality shops Absolutely. that you know. So we know that this is a problem across the country. I yep. don't think we've walked into a shop this year that we haven't kind of went ooh. Yeah. When we got to glass, you're doing great. You've pulled the procedure. Except you've welded the panel on properly, but then you lost it right here. Yep. So yeah, and the painters and the painters don't know this because mm -hmm. painters are painters, and they're and they're told to paint everything. In fact, I even got into, I was talking to a painter the other day and the painter... Got to take it to the edge though, right? Because I've got a warranty, Mark. Well, the painter said, my manager told me I have to paint the whole thing. I, I know what you're saying, Mark, but my painter says I have to paint the whole thing. So my next stop was to the manager saying, come on out here, let's talk about this flange. And of course the manager goes, I would never say that. Whatever. Yeah. You and know. of course, the painter just made it up. Yeah, Completely exactly. made it up with thin air. But I mean, then we have a lot of people online. We've had a lot of discussions and debate le lately about for warranty, it's got to go yeah. to the panel edge. And we've got a lot of people feeling like I've got to paint that, fl that flange because it's part of the panel edge. Well, and, and you do have to have the color be there. So when you look through the glass, but we're talking about where the urethane is going to go, period. Right. And that's it. Nothing there. Nothing there. <laughs> okay. Except epoxy. Right. Okay. To lay a good base or eco. Right. Yep. If I've got the exactly. eco there. Um, so, I don't know. You guys, maybe you've seen this car before. It's, uh, I think, <laughs> the only, the world's only $43 million Honda, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So, we did, I just want to be clear here, we did ask some permission from Todd Tracy and the law yep. firm who represents the Steve Bashan so that we could talk about this vehicle because, um, and I wish Larry was here, yeah. and he's somewhere right now <laughs> going, oh my God, dial me Let in. Let me in. Uh, but when this thing first posted, and we were all at NACE in Chicago at the time, 
all of us weren't, we didn't, when we saw this picture, we didn't immediately go to the roof panel. Right. Our eyes went somewhere else. Went right to the glass. Yeah, it went right to the glass. And we were invited actually to come in and meet with Todd Tracy. Yep. Um, was and it summer? Was it July? It was, August or it was right after the Dallas trade show, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so. yeah. So, and we we got to walk up to the car yep. into his lab and look at it, and all three of us immediately went to the same place. Straight to the windshield. Where do we go, Mark? <laughs> right to the windshield. <laughs> so, what you'll see on this car, and I even talked to uh, Todd Tracy about this, and I said, you know, did you see the windshield? He goes, oh yeah, we saw the windshield, we saw that, but you know, they glued the roof. We didn't even have to go there. Right. You right. Know. So not only was the roof installed improperly, but the glass was installed improperly. Yep. Walk us through this, Mark. Okay, so um, on the screen, the two white arrows are pointing directly to OEM urethane. Right, and you can see it held. The glass is actually even still attached glass to it. Glass is still attached to the urethane. Yep. Now when we get up to the roof, up on top where the red arrows are, there's no urethane at all. Now, this car wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like delivered last week and then got into this thing. This took years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was a couple of years before it actually happened. So we would have Ultimate Cure. Right, right. On, the accident on, was about a year after the repair. Yeah, yep. so we would yep. generally have Ultimate Cure on the urethane. Problem is the urethane just didn't stick to the car. So, you know, this is part of the collision energy management that you talked about earlier where, you know, the damage is going to go up through the A-pillar into the roof and the windshield's part of that. Yep. And so now if you look at the roof, and one of the things we talked about was no base coat, clear coat. Yeah. Now I would say. Yeah, based on this panel when we looked at it, even when we got our hands on it, not just from the pictures, but you can see the uniformity of the coloration from the top of the roof into the flange. Yep. So there's, I would be very confident in saying that this was a base coat, clear coat painted flange Absolutely. that urethane went over the top of. Yep. And so you can see where the shop did urethane to urethane, yep. right, held. Yep. Because we know this glass was taken out because they put a roof panel Absolutely. on, even though they put that yep. roof panel on yep. improperly. Yeah, so, we know so they down the here, on. that worked. Yeah, they were, were putting it back and having adhesive go to adhesive worked yep. really well. But up here, there's nothing. nothing. There's no residuals of there's anything. nothing there. at all. You know, so bottom line is, you know, what we would expect to see, had that been done correctly, is we'd expect to see at least something still stuck there. Right. Now you can argue, okay, there was a fire, there was, a, yeah. Well, we had but, the same but, fire down here. Exactly. Right. Same heat transfer, same everything. The yeah. fire actually was from the ground up, so yeah. actually probably so had more it's heat all in the steering wheel over, over here than we had here. Yeah. So that you can't say that, you know, well, the heat yeah. melted the glue yeah. or so, whatever. So this is, you know, to watch your glass company and watch your paint department and have everybody doing it the right way. 43 million reasons. Right, because I want to be really clear here. Part of the conversation that Mark had with Todd was um, that they, him and his engineers do agree the glass was an issue, but obviously the roof welded. It didn't even have to be brought up. However, had the shop actually replaced the roof panel properly and we would have still had an injury, well, then the glass would have been his $43 million door. That's, that's so, just your next door to walk through. Yeah, yeah. so in his mind, when he, when he discussed this, he had two doors to walk through. Both of them were going to give him the same result. He chose the one to go through that. Yeah. Probably made a bigger well, jury I impression. asked him, I said, what about the glass? He goes, we didn't need that. Didn't need it. Yeah. Why, why bring that to the jury? Yeah. This, the welding was a much better, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, bigger thing to bring to that. So yeah. it's important. You as a shop could do everything right. You could weld that panel on correctly. You could follow the OEM procedures. You could do it all, but if yeah. you miss a step, Either the flange isn't repaired correctly, yep. or you don't know what your sublet glass company is doing when they come back in to do this. Yep. I mean, how many shops actually watch the glass guy? They don't. They don't, right? It's just being done on the back of the shop. So I could have been in a deposition answering for what my glass company did, yep. in this case just as well. So yep. glass will get you in a $43 million hot seat yep. just as well as improper welding or sectioning procedures yep. will. Um, so, so this is what most shops don't do correct. We see the, so we take the vehicle substrate, which is metal, and then we roll up into um, plastic filler. We don't want that there. We're gonna get rid of all that. Okay, and instead of having self etch we'll use epoxy and no sealer, no base coat, clear coat. So what we got is we got metal, epoxy, urethane glass. And then I'm good to go. You're, that's, you know, and Toyota even put out four or five years ago, they said epoxy only, no base coat, clear coat. And like, shout out to Toyota for actually doing the research on it. Right. So this is really simple. You know, your substrate, Epoxy, urethane glass. Now, your glass company might put in, you know, some of their different primers and different things. I'm considering that part of the urethane. But what we want to do at the, at the shop level is epoxy only. Right. Now, for a, let's say it's a new, uh, I've welded on a yep. new quarter panel, Mark, I've spot welded it incorrectly. Yep. Um, and I have my individual areas of the welds, but the rest of this panel is still an e-coat. Do yep. I have to grind off that e-coat to no. get the metal before I epoxy? No, you just scuff it just like you would a normal thing, you know, sand it off and, and Throw on your epoxy. And then I'm good to you go. Know, I'm going to give a shout out. This is a technician that I was talking to about this. 
Uh, his name's Oliver Dion, and he's out of Orlando. So, hey, Oliver, hey. good job. Um, and he basically sent me this picture going, I did it right, which is just awesome. So you can see the outside of the car is painted. The inside is just only epoxy down to the, uh, down to the area. This is ready for the glass company to just put a window in. Just a really super clean job. And that's the way it should be. So that's I see for be. a lot of you guys, you might want to screenshot that and take it out to your, you know, I'd tape it in my paint booth. I'd tape it into the technician's yeah. um, stalls and I'd tape it to the forehead of my glass company. If yeah. I was subletting that out, yeah. this is what we want to have. Yeah, absolutely. And now, unless it's an R&I type situation, I'm reusing glass and then I should have urethane in well, there from if, where if, I if it's it. an R&I, then like if you look at the top and the bottom, there's urethane still mm -hmm. there. So that's how you want to leave it. And just trim it off and then we're going to trim go. it off and put it back in. So let's go through some of the, the details and then drilling down. Just so a when, piece of paper here. When you, you know. researched, yep. so you got on, on TIS actually, yep. Yep. Um, what do we find out? Well, so this is, uh, you know, some of the, you know, I said earlier, you know, you know why do we R&I glass? Why would we replace? Sometimes you're going to have to replace a glass. Okay, so in this particular case, this is uh, from uh, Toyota on, in 2015, and it says that there's a number of non-reusable parts on their car. It could be clips and moldings and fasteners, but one of those is glass. Glass. And, um, well, I guess that didn't work very good, did it? <laughs> glass. <laughs> um, so, it's, it's, it, so it's glass, and it says it's to, designed to only be used once, so if you remove it, it must be um, replaced and not returned. Right, I can't use it again. Can't no. use it again. Can't sell it on eBay either, can no, I? No, I shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. And you know, it's funny, I actually, when I was Googling some stuff on this, there was tons of non-reusable glass available on eBay, you know, on, you know. Craigslist. Oh yeah, everywhere. you name it. It was like all over the place. Um, now, if I'm a shop and I'm selling a non-reusable part out of the back of my shop, is that a liability? Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and the reason why is like in Toyota's case, the research I found is that, you know, they really consider that part to be an, an integral structural part of the car. So like the Toyota Prius on some of them, the, the, the little tri triangle windows in the front and in the back, that's part of the energy transfer into the car. So they are absolutely, you take it out and you put a new one in. Right. You know, and that was the same thing on the Sequoia years ago um, where they said the same thing. Right. And now let's talk, so we did have a question that came up online. Probably yeah. a good time as we're putting that in there, thinking about that. What about these big, huge panoramic roofs that are out on the market these days, where almost the whole roof panel is a piece of glass? Well, it's a piece of glass. So, you know, how is it attached and what does the manufacturer say for putting it back in? You know, you're not gonna, generally speaking, you're not gonna really bolt glass in unless the glass is what's called encapsulated, which means that they form the glass and they put the molding on at the factory. And then there's actual studs that come down that you would actually bolt in. So every one of those is gonna be a little different, but we're gonna do a lot of gluing of roofs that are glass onto vehicles. So it's just following those standards yeah. to the table. And some of those may or may not be reusable. So if you have to r and I a glass roof for a repair, you might repl be replacing a glass roof. Ooh, that's gonna get expensive. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this earlier, um, and this isn't the only OE that has this no. particular situation right this now, just, but real quick, Nissan. This is just Nissan's uh, position statement on uh, things that came out, and this came out uh, June 20, 2016, so about a year and a half ago. And you know, the, you know, the real question is how many of these windshields on a Leaf, a Juke, and a Sentra, and a Quest have been replaced in the last, since this came out, yep. that how many they, mirrors say, were sold? they say that you put a windshield in, you gotta put a new mirror in. It's not reusable. I bet if we if we actually got Nissan to share with us part sales. Oh, I'm sure windshields uh, versus situations. mirrors. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. we would be a little a little shocked about that if yeah. we could get some of that. Yeah, and that, but that's one of their that's that's their they, they say that's the the way that it is. Now, say you're writing an estimate, would you want to know that when you write the estimate? Absolutely. So now the problem is is that and you brought this up earlier mm -hmm. is you know say you, your area gets hit with hail, and you're replacing roofs. Well, if you're replacing roofs, you're obviously going to be pulling windshields out. Mm -hmm. Now the glass is generally not a problem to get, but what about all those back-ordered rear-view mirrors? Exactly, and can I get them? So if that car is drivable for that customer, and we talk about your estimating affecting cycle time and some things that you need to be thinking about, well that's one of the major ones. If a part is on back order or I can't get it, but the vehicle's still drivable and safe for the customer, like a hailstorm, I got dents in my roof, and my hood, and my trunk, or whatever, yep. well I don't want to bring them in, because I definitely yep. don't want to tie that car up um, and have the customer out of that car while I'm waiting on a two, three week back order over yep. a mirror. Yep. Um, and it's definitely, I can't deliver the car and let the customer drive it and say, bring it back later for a mirror. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a huge safety Well, there's issue. a liability. Yeah. yeah. 
I can't have them driving you know, around And anyway. so when do we need to know that? Right now. And what's available to know? The OEM information. Yeah, that thing about I've, that's one of the things that frustrates me the most is that we've never uh, in my career, and I mean I was literally born into the paint booth. So in, in my 43 years of collision repair, um, we have never been in a time where information has been so readily available to us as it is and now. And critical. And it's it's there. We just got to you got to go get it. Yep. It's not hand or spoon fed to you. They're not wrapping it up in the part and yep. sending it to you at the body shop. But it's all there. We just got to go find it. Yeah, and, and one of the things in, in preparing for this show was I, you know, I, I wanted to go out and find some information. I, I knew the information. I was like, I got to find the document, et cetera. Right. And I knew what I was looking for. And I still had to dig a little bit. Right. That's the hard part. Is it? It's you, it's there. You got to find it. Yep. As you get better with it, it's easier to yep. find it. Yep. Um, I got to admit, half the time I struggle, throw my hands up in the air and call Larry and go, Larry, send it to me. <laughs> and, and he's got it like right there like that. I mean, I tried, <laughs> but I quit. Um, yep. So it is frustrating. Yep. Now, Mark, one of the things I hear a lot lately, and we actually met with one of our dealership groups, and OEM glass sales are up for them into this year, yep. like 75% yep. up. Is there... Is, do I have to do OEM glass in some situations, or is that just OEs trying to sell me parts? Well, and that's what most people think. Oh, they're just trying to sell more parts and et cetera. But, you know, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety just recently did their the, some research, and they found on the Honda Civic, some of the models with the aftermarket glass, the bracket was either wasn't there or not positioned correctly, and they had the cameras were aiming one degree off. Now, that one degree off, is a huge difference. Is a huge difference. Yeah, especially when you calculate it. I think Jason Bartnan had the best analogy. He was like, you know, if I'm going deer hunting and I'm, sky, and I'm, I'm sighting in my scope or yep. whatever, as that travels out over 100 or 200 yards, yep. that one degree suddenly becomes, becomes a, lot. a huge issue. And that's yeah. the difference between seeing the car in front of me and claims mit and, you know, mitigation breaking working or not. Yeah, and that's, and that, you know, and, and it's not just like the lane departure and all that. That's like, you know, the, the automatic dimmers on your headlights, you know, it sees the other car. Well, if it's not looking in the right spot, now you got bright shining and there's liability. Yeah. So, oh, we got, you know. and then you mentioned that there's even more than that. There's, you know, even the surround, the blackout surround, some of that <coughs> all plays a huge role. Yeah, well, so basically in, on glass, you got what's called the ceramic frit. And basically, it's the blackout stuff that they, that they use. And if that's not printed the same way and it doesn't reflect exactly the right way, the cameras don't necessarily see out correctly. So like in, in, in Toyota's case, this is Toyota on it. If a non-Toyota gentleman part is used, the forward recognition camera may not be able to be installed due to a missing bracket. So now we can't even put the camera back on the car. Right. So there's all kinds of issues. That's a, so that's it's issue. just really not about wanting to sell more glass. Because I think every time I talk to a dealer department, yeah. the parts department, they're like, we don't want to handle glass, right? Yeah, I got to store glass. Mm -hmm. I got to be super careful with it. Yep. I, I don't think I've met a parts department that wants to be in the glass business, no. but boy, they sure are in it now yep. um, to a rate they've never been before. Um, and, and a little bit about that, it's almost like our glass has become kind of like Google Glass yep. in a way, right? Yep. Yeah, well, you know, you got all kinds of things in there. And they've, and they've been putting electronics in them, defrosters and stuff for years. But you know, now we got to see, you know, the rain sensing wipers and those kinds of things. Can it see through the windshield? Can it see the lanes out there? You know, is there going to be fraction that's, that's actually in the glass? And then on top of that, what are the, the other electronics? Um, you know, if you take an aluminum car, this is one little thing that most people don't know. You take an aluminum car with electronics in the windshield, you need non-conductive urethane because otherwise the, 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 electronics in the windshield will talk to the car. <laughs> so it's basically got to be an insulator with non-conductive urethane sitting in there. So I'm in, a, I'm in a Will Smith situation, right? Yeah. And the cars are taking on the robots. Yeah. But and so heads up display, defrost, cameras, auto wipers, all those different things. That stuff's in the glass. So like, you know, take like Toyota, they say when you pull it out, you know, cut the urethane to here, cut it to here, and then slowly, you know, pull the wire out, and then you got to reinstall it back in the same way. And they're very specific about it. Right. on how to take a glass out. I've seen a lot of posts over the last couple of years pop up where someone kind of makes a, uh-oh, the glass guy cut a wire. Mm -hmm. um, that's a real, that's part of that. If I had that the could procedures be an issue. beforehand, yep. I would have known not to bring my knife around that whole panel there. Yeah. Um, lots to, to look at. And it just keeps coming back to pull the procedures, pull the procedures. You gotta start pull there. Pull the procedures. You know, it's, you know, one of those things when you, you start out with uh, your estimate and you know, the glass company comes in, it's like, oh, by the way, here's how Mazda says or Ford says to do the glass and the glass guy's like I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm a pro. Yeah. Watch me work. You know, but we got to work with them, you know, and you know, I spent a lot of time talking to glass companies, working with them on, you know, the, here's a certain way certain way to do it. We're making it work. Now, Auto uh, Auto Glass Safety Council, it's a it's an ANSI standard. So, 
American National Standards Institute. So this is, you know, like a plumbing standard. I mean, this is a standard of how to put a windshield in. It's on how to replace glass. So here's the document. It's actually a standard. You can read it. It talks about how to put a, <coughs> how to put a windshield in a car, how to take a glass out. You know, it's all right the standard, there. Standard, yeah. The yeah. one, it, I, I don't, I don't want to keep, I know we talked about the beginning of the show, keep driving home. Glass is the one thing that we have a lot of rules around. Mm -hmm. Finally, something in collision repair, we have rules and standards and procedures and federal motor yep. standards and, and, but we still aren't doing it right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's like all those posts that we get of, you know, the body tech going, oh, glass is not my issue. I, I, actually, it is. Yep. You know, how are you putting the, you know, are, are we putting plastic filler and seam sealers under it? And then it's the painter's issue as well. Right, or we find out you can And then subletting. one thing about the, the glass standard is that most insurance companies, when they get contracts with different, you know, glass vendors, et cetera, they actually demand this standard. So they say, you're going you're gonna to put glass in accordance with this standard. And so glass companies have signed up for that. Now, if you're using a reputable, you know, larger glass company, more of a national type company, they're, they're working with that. But what about the guy with the truck? You know, Joe's glass company. Not saying that anything wrong with Joe. I'm not saying that at all. But does Joe know this? And is he doing it? And is he doing it? Right, because there's 43 million reasons 43 why million you need reasons to know what why. Joe's doing. Yeah. <laughs> and so that is available. You can go in and print it and have yep. a copy of you it. You just in go your right shop. to the, um, just, just Google Auto Glass Safety Council, pulls up their website, print this off. What is it about? 15 pages. It's a really good read. Yeah. <laughs> For the weekend or it's whatever. It's a good read. Now, Mark, I see this all the time. Uh, customers driving out of the lot at 5.30 on a Friday and I got a couple little pieces of blue tape holding that windshield in. Um, <laughs> what, what do we need to know about when we can deliver a car after we've put a piece of stationary well, glass in? Well, what's the in? lapse year on the, on the tape, first of all? Uh, two, Very important. Two? Two. From, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It takes me <clears throat> maybe. Yeah. So this is one of the other things. And even the glass companies will tell you this. Okay, now don't drive the car because if, you know, if you take the car, that you've just put a windshield in and you park it with one wheel on a speed bump and the other one in a chuck hole, that car can twist and the windshield can dry in the wrong spot. So it's still wet for a little bit. And then we talked about the, the minimum drive away and the ultimate cure. So there's time. We need time for the glass to, the adhesive to properly set up. Now this is very temperature and humidity specific and time specific. So it's not like you're gonna pop it in and it's gonna be on the road in 10 minutes. And there are some two-part components that you can put on that they have, they have heater strips that they put in there, which can reduce the drive away time. But this all goes back to, <coughs> to the safety standard of 212 and 216. Are you gonna be able to pass those? Now, right. the minimum drive away time, they're gonna give you different levels, but basically it's 30 miles an hour. So if your customer is driving down the road and they hit a barrier at 30 miles an hour, they're gonna pass 212 in their standard. Problem is, what if they're going 80? What, well, I gotta get on the freeway. That's 70, up. 75, yeah. right? So are you gonna be able to pass that? So all the urethanes that are going on all the cars, they have this standard. You just get the technical data, it'll tell you exactly what it is. So this might have you rethink your car going through the shop. You know, it's Friday morning. Do we put the glass in at two, or do we put it in at 8 a.m.? What product are we using? And then the other part of it is <coughs> for the, the glass companies that come in and they put the tape all the way around it, sometimes that'll seal up the urethane. Well, if, if you sealed it up with tape, water's not getting to the urethane. Right, and I need, need that humidity. And we need, we need water to actually dry it. So the best thing you can actually do after the windshield's put in is wash the car. But now we're in Buffalo, New York, and it's 10 below. Not a lot of car washing going on. Not a lot of humidity in the area. Not a lot of humidity. Yeah. You know, you're in Phoenix, Arizona. Not a lot of humidity. But I can you wash know, a car there. Yeah, you can wash your car. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're in, uh, you know, you're in Florida, you got tons of humidity. Yeah, you're good there. Yeah, you're good yeah. there. So it's all product specific. Single part urethanes are based on temperature and humidity, and you got to really watch that. And this is all about the liability. So that's minimum drive away. And then ultimate cure, which is the, the when it actually does get hard and, you know, is done drying, that can take weeks or months. Before you're finally there. Be before you're finally there. But I'm not saying hang out of the car for weeks or months, but 
you definitely want to hit the minimum driveaway standard before you ever release the car, and you got to know that. And right. your glass company will have it. I think we've all probably at one point had a car in our shop that the customer drove or wrecked as they were driving it off the lot after they bought it. Yep. We've all had one in our yep. career, and that very well can happen. I mean, they can drive off of my lot after picking it up and yep. get into a wreck that night. So yep. this is critical because the airbags and everything that's working off of that yeah. system. Yeah, well, you know, and what will happen is, and some of the testing that was done is you do the windshield incorrectly, the airbag deploys, it'll just pop the windshield out of the car. Right. And then it doesn't blow back on the passenger, right. and then I'm impacting so that's, a that's, steering So that's like not putting a seatbelt in the car. Yeah. We wouldn't do that. No, of course not. We, we think, but half of the yeah. time we don't do tension Yeah, so, so glass becomes very important as part of, you know, as part of the process, even though most shops aren't even doing it themselves. Yeah, it's critical. I, one of the things I also want to just keep driving home is that glass plays an impact role in collisions. Yep. It is manufactured and designed and tested to help with energy transfer. If I took that glass out of the car and then had a rear end impact again, I, which I'd love to see, I'd love to wreck a car with a piece of glass in it, wreck a car yeah. with a piece of glass out of it, and, and watch, watch it. where it crumples differently. And that's yeah. all about energy transfer. Yeah. So it's it's not just decoration. It's not just something that's yeah. made to be able to see out of the car and, and not have yeah. a blind spot. Well, There's like the quarter glasses. The quarter glass, the energy is designed to go up into the roof and buckle up there and transfer, and then it's designed to go below, around the passengers. A lot of vehicles without that window in there, properly urethaned in, we've lost the strength of that quarter panel. Right. And that energy goes straight Think in. Think how big those windows are for how big those yeah. panels are. You know, um, and then th and that becomes part of, the, part of the process. Same thing with a lift gate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of people forget lift gates. We think that it's just a bolt-on part, yep. and we forget that that urethane glass and that lift gate has a structural component to it as well. Yeah, well and when we say structural, that's occupant protection is absolutely. what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of deaths, you know, we used to talk about traffic highway fatalities when we got the 60s, 70s, 80s. We've all seen that footage where the new Malibu impacts the Bonneville oh, and we yeah. talk about what the yeah. different impacts were there. Most of those deaths and injuries were because of the G-forces that transfer and it's not like the, the customer, they bounced around and hit something and had yeah. impact trauma to their side or whatever. It was that G-force going into the vehicle mm -hmm. and we've spent a lot of time and energy over the last 20 years redesigning cars so that energy stays away from them and yeah. we definitely don't want to do something in the shop that redirects that energy right back to them. Yeah, and then, you know, take like the, the, the lift gate, for example. So it comes in, it's a brand new part. What do you do? Well, most shops, what they'll do is they'll just, they'll paint, paint the part the off the car. I send it straight over, right? And what we want to do is tape off the area that the urethane's going to go into and leave it just OEM Leave eco. that eco. And then let the glass company come in and do what they do. They'll scuff it and put the urethane on and away they go. But same thing with like sliding doors. The urethaned in sliding door glasses. That's part of the side impact protection as well. So if you walk in your paint department in the shop and see that that's being painted, we want to get the painter to, you know, better to just have the painter watch this show. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a glass shop travel around with a grinder in their <laughs> no. box where they're, they're removing coatings before they put glass in. So there's, no. a, there's a lot to do there um, and it's critical. Yep. So I think glass is one of the overlooked things, mostly because we sublet it, we out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. We don't think that's our baby yep. or we think the glass company's an expert and that they've got it covered. Yep. Um, but I'd probably say that that's a huge issue. There's probably a lot of cars out there. I mean, we see it every day and yep. there's a lot floating around out there. So there's a lot of work to be done. Yep. Now, the little video that you saw earlier is part of a series that we shot in 2012. It is a four part series that's on YouTube. So if you type Repair University windshield, you're gonna find that four part video series where we go step by step into just removing and replacing a windshield. Um, special thanks to Abra. Back, yep. uh, they have a great glass research. Mitch Beckner yep. um, is part of that ANSI. Yep. Uh, group yep. and help set those safety yep. standards. He was part of it, yep. um, and Mitch walked um, <coughs> the whole day with us back in 2012 and walked us step by step through windshield replacement and talks through a lot of these issues, even down to the way urethane has to be applied and the pyramid shape versus just squeezing it out. Yep. Um, there's a lot there, and yep. that's an old program. Yeah, and one other thing I wanted to bring up too is that the urethane that you're using on an American car may not be the same urethane you would use on a European car. They have different specifications. Mm -hmm. And if so, if your glass company is just pulling the same tube out on every car, it might be an issue as well. Yeah, it might be, yeah. And, and then I definitely, as a shop, need to know if I used a, a single part or two part, because I got to know the cure times before it goes. Yeah, your driveway times. Um, and make sure that the customer is safe when they leave there. They've trusted us to repair their vehicle yeah. back. And we, and we always say pre-less condition, that's kind of hard, right? But, but Can't to put it. it back to safety so yeah. that the next time they're in a wreck, it's going to protect them the way it did the first time. To fit form and function. Um, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, Mark, thank you. I think Absolutely. this is one of those shows just like uh, Corrosion Protection where we're going to get a lot of questions at the end yep. of it. Yep. Um, and we're probably going to be back. 
I would say again, maybe next year actually putting in some stationary glass yeah, we'll and, do live. and doing yeah. some things there. Um, so lots to cover. Now, next month, <laughs> we're going to have a good time, Mark. <laughs> That's going to be great. Um, so it, next month's live show is the year-end review, and then Larry will be back, and mm -hmm. Mark and I will be here. But joining us for the year-end review is going to be Mike Anderson. Yep. So he's cleared some time on his schedule, um, and the four of us are going to sit down and talk about what happened in 2017 yep. and what we are expecting for 2018 as it relates to the collision repair industry. Um, and we'll be going over what we think every body shop has to do in December to get themselves ready for January. So yeah. that's going to be a huge show. Um, I always tell people, you know, if you come to CIC or you go to NACE or whatever, you get the experience of when we're all together yeah. at the bar. Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when, let's be honest. When we're all together at the bar after the meetings or yeah. whatever and having those conversations is sometimes when the best education and aha moments happen. And so I really wanted to make sure that at least one time this year everyone got to kind of experience that. So I have no Plus idea yeah. what's going to happen. Uh, Mike asked if he needed it's to have kind of fun to take notes on napkins. It just well, really is. I may be sitting in the corner <laughs> over here, but uh, Mike Mike asked if I needed him to prepare anything, and I was like, nah, man, just, just, just bring yourself and, and a cup of coffee, and yep. we're going to let it go and see what happens. So um, if you have not signed up for Repair University Live um, and you have and you're scheduled to get a ticket, I yep. think that one show's worth the whole yep. $30, 30 yeah, exactly. for that next year. Um, and be thinking about it. If you have any questions um, that we haven't addressed this year for me, Mike, Larry, um, Mark, and, that, and you want to have it covered, well, that's what that year and end shows for about. shows, too. Yeah, well, we, we've sent out a post online yeah, asking yeah. people for what our next year, 2018, should look like. We are, just a sneak peek for you, we'll be launching a secondary live show next year mm -hmm. called OEM Repair. Yep. And that's all those shows will be about is we're going to dive deep into one individual mm -hmm. OEM on each show and, and talk about how to research, how to find, so yep. that you're not like me. And you get frustrated <laughs> and you call Larry and go, just send it to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, the whole purpose of that series will be how to be, not be like me, probably. Yeah. Um, but we will launch another show next year. But, mm -hmm. but Repair University Live will continue, so we are looking for show ideas. Um, but if you have something that's just burning a hole in your brain that you need to know, well, that's what the year-end review show is about. Yep. We're going to just you know, take your calls, so send to your speak, information, yep. um, and let it go from there. So be sure to tune in next month. That is a December 20th show with the three, the three amigos, I guess, will be back, <laughs> um, and Mike Anderson joining us, and we'd love to have your input and participation in that show. Yep. If you have any questions about the information we've covered in today's show, well, you can always reach us on the Facebook page, yep. or you can reach us inside some of the forums on Facebook and the other groups, um, or email us directly. Um, and I'll just fair warning, glass isn't my thing. I'm going to immediately send that to Mark or Larry for yep. you to answer. But uh, <laughs> feel free to send those in. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you December 20th. Great, and we'll see you next month.